Welcome everyone. I am Laura, Manager of Preservation and Outreach at Friends. For almost 40 years now, Friends has focused on preserving and celebrating their architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of the Upper East Side. Some of you are already familiar with one of our speakers tonight as she led our wonderful series celebrating the First Avenue State back in June. If you missed that, all four sessions are available on our website. Lisa is currently the Executive Director at the Columbus Citizens Foundation. Prior to that, she oversaw approximately 100 projects in 60 different countries while working at the War Monument Fund. And she's also a professor at Pratt and a wonderful one in my opinion. Meredith Bergman is the sculptor responsible for the first statue representing historical women at Central Park. She works both on public monuments and on a private scale, exploring issues of history, social justice, race, human rights, disabilities, and the power of poetry and music. Her work has been shown in more than two dozen exhibitions and appear in 10 institutional collections. Thank you both for joining us today for what I believe it will be truly, will be a truly enlightening conversation on public art, history, and the role of women. I'd like to uh, remind all participants to keep your videos off during this. We'll be sharing some resources on the chat. And if you'd like to submit a question, please do so on the chat. Now, Meredith and Lisa. Thanks so much, Laura. And uh, let me pay you an equal compliment. Um, you were a wonderful student at Pratt, and um, it's really terrific when your former students become treasured colleagues. So I'm one of the people thrilled you're at Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, and um, really thrilled to be with everybody tonight. Um, the First Avenue Estate uh, four-part series was great fun to do. Um, and I think that we're gonna match that fun and enrichment tonight because this is really a very exciting conversation to be having. And I'm really grateful that Meredith is with us tonight because as anybody who's involved in any creative enterprise knows, if you're about to have um, a big commission come to fruition, I'm sure that Meredith has no free time whatsoever. So we're really lucky um, to be with her tonight. And before we, you know, turn it over to Meredith to tell us a little bit about the sculpture that she's working on now, um, I, you know, would love to ask her to speak a little bit about her background because Meredith, you've had a fascinating career and one where you've used sculpture to address women's issues and uh, social issues and also um, crises. You've um, worked on topics as far ranging as other pioneering women in American history, as well as a 9-11 um, memorial. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what motivates you and how you ended up um, at this intersection of art and uh, social historical narratives. Hi, good evening and thanks for coming. Um, would you like me to show some images of my past work or speak more generally? Well, why don't we hear from you for a few minutes and then we'll turn it over to see some great images from you. Well, I came to New York at the age of 19 to study design at Parsons and then transferred to Cooper Union where I studied everything except sculpture um, and loved calligraphy and hated video and was basically a graphic design major until I cast a small piece, little piece in the bronze foundry. And when I held this thing, I realized that if I buried it in my backyard, it would be there in 5,000 years. And somehow that delighted me so much. Also, it was fairly easy to do this process. It did not require chipping away for many, many months to create a sculpture. And after that, after I graduated from art school, I went to Italy and studied marble carving and did a great deal more bronze casting and began to study figurative sculpture, um, the actual techniques of building armatures and creating large figures and also studying anatomy. So when I came back from Italy, I realized that being in art school in the 70s, I had no background in traditional art, 
which I loved. I had really fallen in love with art history. So I went to the Art Students League and took courses there, including one with Jose de Creft, who sculpted the Alice in Wonderland statue in Central Park, um, who was 96 at the time. So I've had a, a long education in art, which I've continued to add to, and slowly combined my interest in irreverent and surreal visionary kind of sculpture with narrative figurative work, which is really what I've won commissions to, to create. Well, before we go to seeing some visuals you've prepared for us, I'm sure everybody who's with us tonight knows that um, the sculpture you're, you've been working on that's going to be unveiled later this month um, and for which people can find more information at the website Monumental Women is about women's rights pioneers. Um, and it's, you know, had an interesting journey from original concept to what will be unveiled in about two weeks. And, um, and I know that you've prepared some images for us that will talk about the process very much. And I hope after we look at those images, we can also talk a little bit about the journey from when you first conceived the sculpture to what we're going to see when we walk through Central Park in a couple of weeks. And, um, and then after those images, I hope one of the other things we can touch upon is we won't have the luxury of having you with us when we're in the park in the future. And what are some hints you can give us to make sure we really take away the full import of the sculpture? Okay. Well, let me begin. Hmm. Okay, I'll show you some images. Let me try to do this. Okay. This is our family seal. When my husband was young, he confessed to me that he had always wanted a seal. <laughs> we saw one when we were rowing in Maine, so this became our seal. The motto means to move, to teach, or to delight, which I still aspire to. This is the Boston Women's Memorial, which I won the commission for in 1998 and which was unveiled five years later in 2003. That's not unusual for a public art project to take five, 10, 14 years for the Shaw Memorial in Boston, 20 years for the FDR Memorial in Washington. Um, so the two years for the Central Park Memorial is actually very fast. And in Boston, there was a site where people could interact with the sculptures and three women who never met each other, who actually had no relation except conceptually. So I spaced them as if in conversation in the visitor's mind, you, you put it together when you are there. And they are on a mall where in the 19th century, people used to walk for their Sunday afternoon edification and look at statues of statesmen and great thinkers and generals and men on tall pedestals with inscriptions. So I recycled that vocabulary and gave them pedestals with inscriptions, but they've come down off their pedestals. And that is the cliche of women's liberation. So they've come down off their pedestals, they're using their pedestals as work surfaces. And there's a great deal of biographical information and quotations on the pedestals. And this has become incredibly well loved. Um, Lucy Stone, who was a sometime partner of Stanton, Anthony, and Sojourner Truth, sometimes and antagonist. Um, Abigail Adams, who's one of, I think of her as the grandmother of our country. Uh, and Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American to publish a book of poetry. She was a prodigy. Um, they represent themselves, but also women. That was the assignment. The three women had been chosen already by a committee that had been meeting for over a decade and agitating to win this site. And so the three women had to represent women. So they're three different ages and they're three different attitudes. And Phyllis Wheatley is contemplative, imaginative, young and beautiful. Unfortunately, she died young. So. Abigail Adams is the eldest and Lucy Stone is in middle age. And these pieces can be climbed on. They are climbed on, they are very well loved and they're very well treated. Um, 
the piece in Central Park will be behind a fence. And that was always part of the commission, unfortunately. I like to make sculptures that are approachable. This was for a women's college in South Carolina, Converse College. They put up a series of statues of great American women and commissioned me to do Marian Anderson. So I showed her as if she's stepping to the edge of a curved stage and singing. And this piece can be walked around. The back is also full of life. Um, Okay, and that brings us to Central Park. A group called Monumental Women worked for six years to win a site on the mall and to lift the moratorium against new sculptures in the park and to bring real historical women to the park. So shall I continue and show the... Yes, please, please do. And I guess one thing uh, you know, as you're telling us a little about, there's the physical aspects of the work and creating it, but there's also, I'm imagining, a great deal of archival research, um, both on the site where you're going to place your work, as well as on the figures involved. And I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot you take into consideration as you're conceiving a work that most of us really don't know when we enjoy the final product. Yes. Um, part of it is to get to know the subjects and to immerse myself in their concerns and the concerns of the time in which they lived and worked and fought. But also because these projects take so long, I have to keep my, my interest fresh. So I keep, and of course people keep publishing and doing television specials and all kinds of things about these figures. So I keep getting new attitudes, new information about them. Well, tell us a little bit about, the two years is an extraordinarily condensed period of time to produce this work. So tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you had um, in design, deciding on the arrangement of the figures, as well as some of the physical challenges. You mentioned to me in an earlier conversation that nearly a hundred people worked on the project start to finish. So I think we'd love to hear a little bit about why does it take so many people? All right. Well, first of all, the group Monumental Women. Um, and they did succeed in winning this site, which is kind of on a corner. The mall has a cross path and the original request for proposal specified that this would be on the corner. So it would be visible from different angles and the other sculptures along the mall are almost like sculptures in uh, the bays of a cathedral. They're set into niches between these beautiful, tremendous elm trees that embrace them. And you can't see them so well from the sides or from the back. So this site was really thrilling. And originally I designed for the corner. And then we were informed that no, in fact, the sculpture would have to be directly across from the existing sculpture of this guy, Fitzgreen Halleck, a 19th century poet who was tremendously popular in his time. Um, and most of the statuary is one man on one pedestal. So the fact that the Central Parks, that the Parks Department and the Central Parks Conservancy would even allow two figures was already quite a victory for monumental women. And the call for proposals also specified that this should be as inclusive as possible, that the two women should be portrayed as statues, but there should be dozens of other suffragists and fighters for women's rights included in some way, and that was up to the artist. So my original design showed Stanton and Anthony working together. Here they are in old age in a pose studio photograph. But just a detail that I want to come back to later, you'll see that Stanton is wearing a dress with chains printed on it or woven into it. And I asked her great, great granddaughter, what's with the chains? And she said, oh, she was always messaging. Huh. So I felt free to add as much symbolic content to this as, as I could. Um, so I began with a little model, this is 10 inches high or something, just fooling around with, with bodies, trying to show the energy of Susan B. Anthony coming to greet Stanton, who is writing, 
because Stanton had seven children and Anthony never married and had no children and they led very different, very complementary lives and had a lifelong friendship, partnership and were often quite combative. So there was a tension between the figures and I came up with this design where, again, Anthony has arrived, Stanton is seated, um, Anthony is showing Stanton a document from her bag, Stanton is writing, and from her desk comes down this huge bronze scroll. Here it's just paper, but it was intended to be bronze, with quotations from 20 other women that began in 1848 when Stanton and others held the first, the world's first women's rights convention, and ended in 1920 with a vote. And these would be the voices of these other women. The statues would be mute, and the huge bronze scroll coming forward to meet you, coming forward into the future, would be their voices, which I hoped would provide a good balance. But in fact, the, um, the Public Design Commission uh, required us to remove the scroll and the ballot box and any mention of the suffrage movement. So here I am working on the two figures, getting them to this stage at one third height scale. You can't jump from something little to something nine feet tall. You have to make an interim height model and make all your mistakes at this size and then go to the enlargement because the changes would just take too long. So at this stage, we had just the two women, no scroll, and Monumental Women and I felt that we really needed to include a third figure. And Sojourner Truth seemed the most obvious and ideal one because she was a contemporary of these women. She was 20 years older than Susan B. Anthony, but they met, they worked together. She was a house guest of Stanton's. Stanton's daughter read the newspapers out loud to her in the morning. And they corresponded and worked at the same women's rights convention. So I started, you'll see a kind of skeletal figure on a little white chair here. I started modeling a figure of Sojourner Truth to, to fit with the other two, the writing desk. I got rid of and made it a round table so they could really gather around it. And you'll see also that in the background, I've already started the enlargement of the other two figures. That was absolutely necessary to, to meet this deadline, but it was a little bit like playing chicken with the approvals process. So I modified the other figures. I turned their heads, I raised and lowered their arms. I turned them in relation to the front view. I made many changes without actually changing the mass of their bodies um, so that I could arrive at this. And so uh, I think, you know, I'm, before we go on, you know, you obviously work in a very figural mode, but uh, this is not like taking a photograph and replicating it in sculpture. So this is a scene that never existed potentially. So there's a certain abstraction to it and incorporating ideas. And um, in something I read about your work, I read that you were very concerned that the figures convey a sense of activism. So having them dynamic as figures was important to you. And so how did you decide, you know, what actions they would convey as they were at this table together? Well, I didn't, oh boy. Um, I wanted to show them at work. Uh, I don't really like statues that simply stand and display themselves. That seems like a missed opportunity. It seems inert. And I wanted to show a scene that could have occurred and should have occurred and quite plausibly did occur of these three women working out strategy, um, discussing all the things that we are discussing now, which they did about racism and inclusion and representation and citizenship and what it means to be a human being. And a sculpture like this that is a monument has a dual role. It, it shows, as with Boston, it, it's, it portrays the figures, but they are representative of something more than just themselves. 
So the three have different, different attributes, different attitudes. Sojourner Truth, who was famous as an orator, is speaking. And Susan B. Anthony has arrived from her organizing. She's got her traveling bag stuffed with documents, overflowing, and she's going out to show them. And Stanton is about to write because she was the philosopher of the movement, the writer. That's great. I don't want to interrupt your flow. I know you've got some other things to show us. Um, and I, you know, this is the 100th anniversary of women receiving the right to vote. So, um, you know, I, that must have been factored into your concept as well, that this was going to be a monumental occasion as well as this incredible opportunity to add something new to Central Park um, and to add real women to Central Park since, uh, as everybody knows, um, the most famous woman in Central Park as of right now is uh, Alice in Wonderland. So, um, you know, this was monumental on several levels. And, you know, I, it's hard to be an artist under the best of circumstances, but there were a lot of eyes on this commission as well. So was there ever a moment where you had some doubts about how you wanted to construct the monument? Yes, there were many. But this is not the first time I've faced this kind of contentiousness or discord. Um, every public commission ends up in this kind of muddle. And it's really up to the artist and the people who commissioned the monument to find the vision to get through all of that and hold to that vision and help that vision grow and expand to include the comments of others, the voices of others, the attitudes of others, if possible. And this, this design is so much better than the original design. And the community is so much more inclusive and has grown so much more. I'm very happy that it changed and that it's now the three women working together. So now how does it get from the foundry to Central Park? Um, I imagine this is not an easy task and something that you must be very immersed in the details right now of um, how does it become the gift to the city that it's about to be. Okay, I'll go back to photos. Excellent. And there we go. Okay. Yes. So uh, you saw the, yes. I commissioned uh, digital enlargements of the figures. So you see Elizabeth Cady Stanton in a kind of hard foam and Susan B. Anthony with some clay added to the foam. So the foam is, is, is an armature, even though it has details on it. Most of those were obscured by a later layer of clay. So then you begin working at the large size. Um, Anthony is nine feet tall. Uh, her head was removable, her hands were removable. Here's her head, which I brought down to a table to work on. And here I am with one of my two part-time assistants who were wonderful, uh, putting some finishing touches on the, basically the drapery, the folds, which tell the story of the pose. You see in the folds of the cloth how someone has just moved. Stanton is kind of leaning forward on her chair and Sojourner Truth is, is seated back in her chair but leaning into the table to speak. And all, all of that is reflected in the clothing. The wrinkles are actually very important to the sculpture. Um, then molds are made and this basically wrecks the clay models. Um, they're taken apart, uh, they're cut, and you're, you're seeing uh, three men removing the inner layer of the mold, which is a flexible rubber, uh, which they are then going to lay inside the thing in the foreground that looks like a big white spoon. That's the outer layer of the mold. And then those molds are taken to the bronze foundry, reassembled, and hot wax is painted inside up to a thickness that will be bronze, but left hollow. So this is a man working inside Susan B. Anthony, not something you see every day. And here is Anthony's head 
and part of her skirt. And the committee has come to uh, the foundry to see the waxes. You can see a little bit of the head of Sojourner Truth. And then each of these pieces is cast separately in bronze. And then they are welded together. Um, this is tack welded. It's just welded in dots so that I would go to the foundry and approve the position of the hands. You see there's no table yet. Um, and then it's welded seamlessly and ground and all the metal is finished. And here are two women with blow torches in 89 degree heat, um, putting the chemical patina on the finished bronze. And this requires heating the metal and painting on acids and pigments and other chemicals that penetrate the metal just enough to form a coating. And then there's wax put on it, and then it goes to the park, which it will tomorrow morning. Well, that's exciting. I, um, since you had one image that was a close-up of um, one of the dresses in the New York Times article that ran a few days ago, there, you know, were some fascinating details revealed in that article about um, some of the use of adornment and messages you were telegraphing. And, um, you know, I, I think our audience would love to hear a little bit about some of those designs and what they mean and, um, you know, so that we can impress our friends when we walk in the park and tell them little tidbits that uh, they don't know. Well, each woman has an attribute, which is something that traditionally statues have. They have something they're holding or carrying that identifies them. Sojourner Truth had her knitting because in the photographs that she had made of herself, which she sold to support herself, there was a, a title below each photo that said, I sell the shadow to support the substance. And she often showed herself with knitting because it was important to show what she had achieved as a free woman. And she worked with many, many newly freed slaves and had to broadcast her achievement and her status. And knitting was a skill of, of ladies. It was a patriotic duty during the Civil War to knit for the army. And it was a skill that was often not taught to slaves. So it was quite an achievement. And she always displayed it. Um, Anthony has her alligator bag, which was the subject of fun. She was also known for her red shawl, which she's wearing, but of course in bronze, there's no color. Um, Stanton, oh, you don't see her so well. Um, where do we have Stanton? We don't really. Anyway, um, Stanton's dress has a pattern, not of chains. I tried many, many different <laughs> emblems and symbols to come up with something. Thunderbolts at one point, because she said to Anthony, um, I forged the thunderbolts and she hurled them. But that didn't work. That had unfortunate associations. And we tried, oh, the V for victory and all kinds of things. And finally settled on a sunflower, which was, which became a suffragist symbol in the state of Kansas. And the color yellow became symbolic of woman suffrage. But when Stanton was quite young and began to write editorials and publish letters to the editor, very much against her parents' wishes, especially her father's wishes, she signed them with a pseudonym, which was Sunflower. So she has the brooch as well that is a big sunflower. And Anthony has a, cam a big cameo brooch that is the head of Minerva, the Roman goddess of wisdom and strategy. And well, those so are sorry. fascinating details. I'm going to encourage everybody as well to go to Monumental Women Dot org because the website is filled with a lot of fantastic information. And um, since there can't be a big ceremony uh, when the sculpture is unveiled in a few weeks, um, I know from you that it's going to be live streamed and the details will be on monumentalwomen.org. Um, and um, you mentioned that there's going to be uh, a CBS segment this coming Sunday about the sculpture. And I would encourage everybody to keep an eye out because I think this will be a tremendously 
um, interesting event as well as something that's very significant for all of us. Um, and I think, you know, it's important for so many reasons, but we're at a very interesting moment in time. Uh, the whole idea of sculpture is on people's minds in a way it hasn't been before. Um, or maybe it has been, but it's more apparent right now. And a lot of questions about what our public monuments should be and how our public monuments need to express our values. Um, and they can only express our values today, really. But I would think that we all hope that a monument like this will withstand the test of time. And I guess as we sit here grappling with what public monuments mean, and this sculpture is about to become a very prominent sculpture in New York City, you know, what, what should we be thinking about that very first time we take a walk in the park and see the sculpture? I mean, these are three important women. We probably don't know as much about them as we should, even if we think we do. So hopefully this is a springboard for learning. But, um, you know, what are the messages you hope people take away when they go see it for the first time? There are so many messages. There are deep ones and there are immediate ones. And the immediate one is women working together uh, for a more humane society, listening, arguing, conversing, working it out in person or through Zoom um, <laughs> together. And I think the, the representation, the actual depiction of serious, accomplished women who put their whole spirit on the line for something they believed in and fought for the rights that we often take for granted or are utterly ignorant of their fragility and their how recent they are, um, these rights. Uh, I think it's wonderful to just see them represented in this collection of statues of great men and great thinkers. And I have one final question before we turn it over to our audience. Obviously, you've had a lot of experience with outdoor public sculpture. Um, and outdoor sculptures face a range of assaults that something inside a museum doesn't. So particularly in New York, there's bad weather. Um, you know, there's heat, there's high humidity, there's snow, uh, there can be terrible rainstorms. And obviously, bronze as a sculptural material has been around for a very long time. As you said, when you made that very first one, you realized it could be there thousands of years into the future. But, you know, when you were working on the patina and thinking about some of those details, like the sunflower or the knitting, are there any special considerations that you had to think about in terms of how this was going to withstand its environment? Sure, there's a, a craft to this. Um, you have to think about how rainwater will drain off the statue so you don't get puddles or uh, pools that will turn to ice in the winter. Uh, the patina and the wax have to be recorded so they can be renewed and uh, you need to think about things like the pen that Stanton is holding so that it is welded in enough places or the eyeglasses so they are attached firmly enough that they can't be simply ripped off because people will unfortunately try to mess with this as they do many statues. Uh, statues of soldiers lose their swords and um, yes, you have to think of how it will withstand all kinds of interactions. Well, I um, will give you the final word and then um, turn it back over to Laura to um, moderate our, our Q&A because we still have, you know, about 20 minutes to um, talk with our audience. But um, I think, you know, you've done such a magnificent job and it's going to be so exciting to walk in the park and uh, see Women's Rights Pioneers Monument and we all will think of you, and um, but you know, let us know what your final thoughts are before we turn it over for Q and A. Well, I guess my great hope is that this will be seen as a gift to the city, meaning all of us, 
not a challenge, not a, a throwing down of a gauntlet, not as uh, anything but a positive gift and a challenge in the sense that other statues of women should be erected and designed and installed wherever people want to see them, which is pretty much everywhere around the city. <laughs> um, we're, we're really missing. And a lot of that is that the achievements and actions of women were not considered worthy of statuary. And boy, has that changed. And boy, do I look forward to a female vice president and onward. Well, that's great. It just dawned on me that I should ask you one more question, which is, um, we know that you've done the Boston Monument. I believe you have uh, a sculpture on Roosevelt Island. Uh, and at St. John the Divine. So is that right? If people want to see other works of yours in New York City, can they do that? Yes, I was going to make a little uh, map at some point with where my sculptures are. There is a monument to a memorial to September 11th in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. In the lobby of the County Cullen branch, the New York Public Library is a memorial to County Cullen. In the stairwell of the Brooklyn Historical Society, there's a big sculpture of, about the abolitionist movement in Brooklyn and an enslaved girl and the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher and a lot of other things that relate to their building and their collections. And the sculptures on Roosevelt Island are cast in bronze, but they are in my garage. Oh. And <laughs> the site is still being worked on. We had hoped it would be installed in the spring and we got held up by yet another bureaucratic snafu. That commission has been in progress for almost 11 years. So I hope that will be unveiled in the fall. And that's a monument all about ability and disability, about science and polio research and pandemics and people. So it will be very timely whenever that is able to be unveiled. Well, that sounds like a wonderful opportunity to bring you back and have another conversation. So I would um, thank you so much for your time. And Laura, do we have Q&A? We do have Q&A. We have lots of questions. I am going to start uh, by asking everyone that has their videos off to turn their videos on so we can see everyone and uh, um, have the conversation here. And before I go to Q&A, actually, this was one of the questions that people asked is, uh, Meredith, could you speak a little bit about how the ceremony will be? If people want to watch it, if they will, they are they able to go and be socially distanced in person or what is the best way to do that? I'm afraid they're going to close that part of the Central Park Mall because the city will not allow us to hold a public gathering. We can only have a press conference with a few speakers and guests. Um, and that'll be that, but it will be televised, it will be online, it will be streamed live, but also archived to be seen later. And there's a great deal of content that's part of it that's been pre-recorded, including these wonderful talking statues with great actresses reading the words of the three women. Uh, Viola Davis as Sojourner Truth, Meryl Streep as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Jane Alexander as Susan B. Anthony. And then three more actresses reading them in Spanish. That is uh, wonderful. I can't wait to hear all of that. And that speaks to another question that we have had is that, uh, is there going to be any explanatory material at the site next to the statues? that talks either a little bit about what you talked today or more information or a little bit different? When I first submitted my design, I had that scroll coming forward to the fence and then a, a digital kiosk where you could read everything online about these women. That we could not do, but there will be website information more than you could imagine uh, available about these women. And that's really the best we can do. I don't even think they can do a QR code. So the monument on the front says women's rights pioneers and their three names and that's it. And the rest is up to Google. All right. 
Well, the rest is up to also the Monumental Woman website that Lisa has been mentioning, you mentioned too, and I shared with everyone on the chat. There is a lot of information on the website. It's a wonderful resource for everyone. And it's good that you talked about the scroll that brings us back to another question that came from more than one person that they were curious why uh, the, the scroll and the voting um, box was removed and any mention of the suffragette movement had to be removed. I can't really speak to that. It's complicated and political and it involves a lot of attitudes I don't agree with. So I'll leave that one if you don't mind. Um, oh, absolutely not. I, I think, you know, great people are also flawed and they're- Well, I think let, let's just say public commissions are complicated and, uh, and a lot of opinions fly around. So Laura, somebody wrote a question to me that may not have reached you, which is somebody wrote um, to me asking the uh, position of Sojourner Truth and Susan B. Anthony that it, it doesn't look like they're in dialogue. And sometimes it's hard when you're looking at a photograph to know what it actually is like in real life. But I mean, are their heads positioned so that it appears they're in dialogue or are they more in isolation? I think, um... Having worked a lot with actors, my husband is a writer and director, I'm used to seeing things caught in a frame that are in flux. So I'm trying to show a moment where heads are facing in one direction, but they might have just been in another direction. So Stanton and Truth are looking at each other. Anthony is looking at Stanton, but Stanton is not looking at Anthony. She's kind of ignoring her and ignoring the hand on her shoulder and focusing on Truth. But maybe a moment earlier, they were talking, or a moment earlier, Anthony was talking to Truth. I hope that they're enough in motion and they're lively enough that you can find the, the di is there a term like a trialogue? I don't know, there's the dialogue <laughs> between two of them, but um, it's a conversation. And it's just one moment in that conversation. So I, well, I I, I you know, just want to follow up. You know, there were a couple of people who wrote to me instead of you, Laura, and I want to be fair to them. So a lot of us remember seeing those early images of the scroll and, um, and the fact that those quotes uh, have resonance. Will they live on in the Monumental Women's website? Are they all captured there? They are captured there. And I believe there may be some provision for people to request additions. And I hope that they will be added onto beyond 1920, you know, once this commemorative anniversary is over. But yes, they are preserved there. Oh, that's great. So, Laura, that takes care of all the questions that people wrote to me privately mm -hmm. instead of to you. So, finger. We could do raising our hands if people would like to raise their hands. I still have a few questions that I want to go through. And one of them is more about your line of work, uh, uh, your specific work, Meredith, and what inspires your consistent artistry? Like, do you work a certain time of the day? What, how, how do you create? I wish. <laughs> no, uh, these projects give my life a wonderful structure. Um, I am the mother of a young adult son with severe autism, and I also work on my husband's projects, so I don't lead a regular life. And we do one project at a time, and this project has kind of occupied the whole family for a couple of years, uh, that and getting my son through college. He's going to graduate in the spring, and uh, it's... It's not a, a day, it's not a daily practice, but I am always working in my head, writing, um, imagining images, uh, getting ideas for sculptures. Perfect, thank you. I will, uh, Kat, I see you. I'm going to unmute you and allow you to ask your question and then we're gonna go back to the questions that are 
on the chat. Oh, Kathy, I'm, now I'm, I'm muted. Great. I'm just thrilled about your work. And to, I've known your work since the Statue of Phyllis Wheatley. And um, the monument just moves me in so many different ways. But I wondered what monuments strike you in the world. There are so many places in which we've seen watershed moments and the opportunity to create narrative through monuments and to re-examine history. Are there any particular monuments right now that move you? There are many. I, I love the Statue of Liberty. I love its size. I love where it is. Um, I love what it has meant to people arriving in this country. Uh, my father's father uh, came over at the age of 13, actually not to Ellis Island. He came to a, a place on Long Island, um, but the Statue of Liberty- Montauk? Uh, no, somewhere I think called Castle Garden on Long Island. Yeah, wonderful. Uh -huh. Anyway, he, um, it, it has welcomed immigrants and refugees, and it means a great deal to me. Uh, boy, there's just so much art that, that I hold in my head um, all the time. It's hard to, to single out a single monument. I'd have to think about that. Thank you, Kat. Um, let me just go over, so have so many questions popping in here. Um, so uh, there are two questions that are similar about the statue being fenced in. Um, first off, uh, who's, why did the statue need to be fenced in in the first place? And second, how close can you get, how close to it can you get, like how far away from the fence will be positioned? You can get quite close. The statue is on a five foot high pedestal and it's five feet back from the fence. So you can get very close to them. Um, but it is set in the same way that the other statues are set. They're all behind the pipe fence, which is there really to protect the trees and the soil that surrounds the trees from being packed down and trampled. Um, because the elm trees are very fragile and they're very precious, uh, maybe more so than the statues. <laughs> so that, that this has been kept. We did, we did ask if there was some way to rebuild the fence so it ran behind the statues and you would be able to go in around them, but no. All right. Um, and I think uh, another question that speaks to Kat's question and the other questions about your work, what are some sculptors that influenced you in your work? Well, again, I, I look and I study all the time, but just off the top of my head, um, uh, Francisco Zuniga, a Mexican sculptor who did beautiful sculptures of women and had some statues on uh, Madison Avenue and 80th Street for years. They were outside of an apartment building of three women walking. Very massive, very beautiful. Um, but I also love more absurd sculptures. I, I love a lot of Henry Moore. I love Jean Arp. Um, surrealist, abstract things. Uh, figurative sculpture. Bruno Lucchese has been a big influence. These may not be people you've heard of, but they're, if you practice figurative sculpture, you, you have looked at them and thought about them. And of course, the sculptors of the Italian Renaissance. I've been studying all my life. I lived and worked in Florence, and I think all the time of Michelangelo and Donatello and uh, John Bologna and Ghiberti and, you know, mostly men, <laughs> but I love the work of Elizabeth Frink, a British sculptor, and uh, Penelope Jenks, who did the Eleanor Roosevelt statue, has done beautiful, amazing figures of women. So they're, it just, it's a whole library in my head. That's wonderful. Um, I think that this has been a great Q&A. We do have more questions here, but we're approaching our and time, and if you submitted a question that didn't get uh, responded, please email it to me and I can forward it to Meredith. And if you have any questions 
um, that you didn't submit anything after, just feel free to email them to me. And as a reminder, um, go to the Monumental Woman website. Uh, <clears throat> It, they have all the information that you can get on the statue, on the unveiling. That's where they're going to be live streaming the the unveiling of the statue. I'm sorry. The ceremony. And the ceremony. And uh, also don't miss uh, CBS Sunday morning, this Sunday with the news. And if you missed the New York Times article next week, from past week, week um, it, it's a wonderful article. This conversation uh, was recorded and uh, it will be posted on our website and our library where all our events are. So if you miss this, if you really like this and you like to watch it again or send it to someone that would love it, please feel free to do so. It might take a few days for it to be up, but bear with us, it will be up. Um, and again, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Meredith. This is a wonderful statue coming up. Uh, your work is really inspiring for women and men too, I, I hope. And uh, well, thank you everyone that shared Thursday evening with us. And I hope to, oh, see you can't well, Maybe we can face. unmute everybody quickly and give Meredith oh. a round of applause. Uh, uh, yes, let's do that. Everyone is unmuted. Six, eight, nine, eight, we got that. And we got that. One more Vanguard. Now we need oh. Los Fargo Gary. Does Gary have one in 4131? Right. It's non-IRA. All right. Wow. Thanks so much, Meredith. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Laura. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, and goodbye. I'll see you in the park.